Welcome, everybody. Um, it's really fun to, uh, for me to welcome Paul Shirley. Um, Paul and I met a long time ago when uh, he was in my class. He, he, was, he was pretty darn good, and I don't understand uh, how a young man could play basketball as many hours as uh, they expected to play in, in top-level college ball and still be uh, pretty good at ME 311, I think it was. <laughs> yeah. um, so let me read the introduction here, and then we'll... Uh, We'll bring Paul on. Paul grew up in the small town of Meridian, Meridian, Mer Meriden, Meriden, thank you, Meriden, Kansas. Played high school ball at Jefferson West. He went to Iowa State University on a National Merit Academic Scholarship, majoring in, I'm delighted to say, mechanical engineering. I don't know he uses it all the time right now, but, uh, but I'm still delighted to say that he majored in mechanical engineering. Um, I am a family man uh, who, uh, has children and grandchildren, thinks family is real important, so I want to introduce Jane. <laughs> Paul's mom is right, right there, okay. Um, Shirley worked his way from walk-on to three-year starter for the Cyclones basketball team, coached by Tim Floyd. The Cyclones progressed to the Elite Eight of the NCAA basketball tournament in his junior season. His college career, he earned three academic All Big 12 selections in his senior season, was named second team academic All American. Since graduating, Shirley has played power forward for 13 different professional teams, including the Phoenix Suns, Atlanta Hawks, Chicago Bulls, and teams in Badalona, Menorca, Spain, Badalona, Menorca, Spain, and Kazan, Russia. His book, um, which is really good, the way we found this, uh, I mean, I, I think about old students from time to time, but I'm going through the airport and I see this book by Paul and I pick it up and read it and think, hey, he's been all over the world. I bet he'd be good for globalization. was lucky enough to find him by poking around on the Google a little bit. And uh, here's the book that I read and you can too. And there's, uh, they're selling it outside and uh, Paul will sign it off for you if you like after class. Paul, we're delighted to have you here. Welcome. All right, so we gotta take this slowly because I'm just a dumb basketball player. Gotta get out the books first. Uh, first of all, I have to say about Dr. Bernard, I did take his class and I had no idea what was happening most of the time. Uh, I did have a very smart roommate though who helped me a lot. We were writing computer programs and I don't know how to do those. So he assisted me greatly, which was nice of him. Um, first of all, Oh, got to get out the notes. As you can see, I'm kind of a lo-fi guy. You're not going to have a PowerPoint presentation, and I apologize for that. You just have to deal with me up here talking with my hands and maybe referring to a couple of books. Um, okay, first order of business. I have to apologize to this one lady. I came to Iowa to talk about my book like two months ago. And in that talk... I'm prone to making sarcastic remarks, and sometimes those will get me into trouble. And I apologize in advance to you guys if something offends you. It probably won't, because my mother's here, so I have to be nice, try not to curse. If I do, then she won't ride home with me tomorrow. Um, so anyway, I, I'm talking and I'm making jokes about you know, being an engineer and how there weren't very many girls in engineering. No offense to the girls here, but we would all know that there are not very many girls in engineering. This is kind of just a fact. So this lady, they broadcast this talk on the public access channel in Des Moines. This lady writes me a message on MySpace. I know you're going, MySpace, how lame. Facebook's the way to go. But I'm old. I'm older than you guys, except for some of you in the back. Um, anyway, so this lady writes me a message. She's like, I can't believe you would say this. I have young daughters, and what if they want to grow up to be engineers, and blah, blah, blah. And I have to tell this woman and you guys, just because you observe something doesn't mean you necessarily approve of it. I would have loved for there to be more women in engineering. It just, there weren't. So I had to talk about it. Anyway, I wouldn't have known what to do with the girls if they were in engineering anyway. So it was pretty much irrelevant. I saw a picture of myself yesterday. I was looking for old pictures. When I thought I would, I thought I would do something like cool and very professorial and put something on the board, that obviously isn't going to happen, but I was like, well, maybe I'll get some old pictures of myself or whatever. I looked at a picture of myself from these days but gone by, and I look exactly like my 18-year-old brother who just went off to college. My 18-year-old brother looks like he's 16, 
the picture that I was looking at was from my junior year in college. So I wasn't going to have success with these girls, these mythical girls anyway. So probably it's for the best that there weren't any girls. I wouldn't have time to deal with them in the first place. So that's my apology. Okay, so I'm by no means a fantastic public speaker. I do okay at times when I'm able to get on a roll. That said, I want to provoke you to ask me questions. I'll talk for a little while here about globalization and try to make you think that it somehow affected me as a professional basketball player slash writer. And then I want you to ask me questions about whatever you want. Hopefully it's vaguely on topic because these guys right here have lots of notebooks and it looks like they want to take some notes, which is new to me. I'm shocked by that because nothing I say is going to be noteworthy, but we'll deal with that. So in or anyway, in order to persuade you to ask good questions, I'm offering up these two copies of my books to my favorite questions. This is completely up to me. We're not going to vote on it. It's just it's my decision what the best questions are. And I realize that this is very like self-serving because it's my book, but I'm not charging you for it. I'm just going to give it to you, which I think is a pretty good deal. So come up with good questions if you can. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how globalization, if you will, has affected me as a basketball player. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about like what that means, as in how does that affect the world in general. And then I'm going to talk about what I've learned to do in order to solve these problems because it, you, know, you, you guys are here listening and you're like, well, that guy's 30 years old. He must have all the answers, so I'm going to give you those answers. <laughs> all right, so globalization to me means that I can go play basketball anywhere in the world. When I graduated from Iowa State, I went off to the Los Angeles Lakers, who at the time were the defending world champions. And I was subsequently the first one cut because I had no chance to make the team. I got embarrassed by Kobe Bryant. Shaquille O'Neal was really cool, though. He once said to me, this is a story, I think I wrote this in my book, but you probably haven't read my book, so I can say it again. I walk up to Shaquille O'Neal the first day. I'm like, shy guy from Kansas, went to Iowa State, you know, kind of talk like this a little bit. I'm like, hey, man, my name is Paul. And he said, I know who you are. And I was like, really? And I almost fell on the floor. But that's just kind of a demonstration, Shaquille O'Neal, cool guy. So when you see him play next year, remember, Shaquille, good dude. After that, went off to Greece, to Athens, Greece, which is a little weird as your first job, first real trip away from the United States is to go live in Athens, Greece. So, I mean, I think that's a bit of an example of globalization. But more appropriately, what this means to me, we all know, I saw in the course catalog that the world is flat by Thomas Friedman is a required reading or recommended reading or something like that. So everybody in the world's read this book, which should have been a pamphlet because it's like he just says the same thing over and over and over again. That's a hint. Don't tell this guy, but just read like the first two chapters and you're good. You don't need to read anymore. <laughs> but the point of this book is, yeah, the internet changed things. Okay, good. So the internet and this power of globalization affects me because in the old days, a team in, say, Belarus might have need for a basketball player. So they call their shadowy network of Belarusian agents and come up with some like pool of players who might be eligible. But this would take weeks, and who knows who they might end up with. Probably Chris Koch or something. It's an old University of Iowa reference that no one got here. Okay, so then they might get a player who's probably not that well suited to their team, but he's the best one available at the time, considering the circumstances. Well now, because information is so readily shared, a basketball team says, what we need, this is what we need. We need a six foot ten white guy who's from Kansas, who's like kind of good, but he's not going to ask for that much money. So where could we find that guy? And so they look on the internet and they're like, this dude's kind of a jackass. He writes about himself and always talks about how terrible he is. Maybe we could get him because, again, we don't have any money. So then they maybe find my email address, much like Dr. Bernard did or whatever. But the point is that it's, more, it's, it's much easier to find the right player for the right mold. And this, there are corollaries in industry, I'm sure, but I'll leave that to you to decide. I'm sure that John Deere, when they need a particular manufacturer, it's much easier for them to find the right one than it was 20 years ago. And in the same vein, it's easier for people to find me as a basketball player. 
Of course, the problem with that is that it's very competitive. And so, in the old days, if I had been born 25 years ago, I would have been in the NBA for my entire life because I'm this tall. Let's, can we, I would need somebody to stand up. Because you, you can't really appreciate it. Could you stand up for a second? I'm really tall. See, like, this is... <laughs> This is, a, this is pretty much a normal-sized human, and I'm much taller than he is. In fact, to the degree that two days ago I was in a Walgreens in Kansas City, and this lady goes, I'm walking up to the desk, and she's training some girl, and she says, man, you are really tall. What are you, eight feet tall? And I'm like, I thought she was joking, of course. I'm like, no, that would be really tall. And she's like, well, you got to be like seven and a half. I'm like, really? Because, again, tall, but not like, oh my God, I saw the tallest person in my life tall. So, but I am, but I am tall. So anyway, if I had been born 25 years ago, I would have played in the NBA for my whole career because tall 6'10 guys who have fairly broad shoulders and can make a jump shot are few and far between. between. But now they're not so difficult to find. That means that in this world of basketball, they can find lots of 6'10 white guys that can make a jump shot, and they can easily find them. Which means that for me, oftentimes I have like 48 hours to decide if I want to go to Gdansk, Poland to play. Which is the truth. That actually has happened to me. My agent calls and said, do you want to go to Gdansk, Poland for a year and play basketball? Surprisingly, I was like, because I'm a dork too. I was like, well, Gdansk, that sounds kind of cool. But it didn't happen and sad. Along the way, I've been, I was offered a job in Greece once that would have been a three-year contract that would have netted me quite a bit of money, not so much money, but in addition, a Czechoslovakian passport, sorry, Czech Republic passport. You might ask, why would that be important? In European basketball, only two Americans are allowed per team, so it's nice to be European that drives your asking price up and stuff like that. So it's a bizarre world, and it's also a fast-paced one. I had to, one time, I was in Phoenix after being released by the Phoenix Suns. You'll notice, if you are so lucky as to ask a good question and read this book, that I've been released lots of times. So it's like, you don't have to feel sorry for me. I'm used to it. It's just how my life works. So I was released by the Phoenix Suns. They declined my option, which means we hate you, and we don't want you to play basketball for us ever again. So that fall, I was in Phoenix trying to just somehow persuade them into, talking, or into letting me play basketball for them again. And a team from Russia calls my agent. Backtrack to the year before when I had been in Kazan, Russia, and I called that very same mother over there who's sitting there the first night in tears, like, I'm thinking about throwing myself out the window because this is the worst place I've ever been. Don't go to Kazan, Russia. It's terrible. Just the worst. Moscow is kind of cool, but Kazan is just not, not fun. So anyway, I had, had made this determination that I was never going back to Russia. My agent calls, and quick tangent, I'm going to say like some things about how much money I was offered and all that. I'm not trying to like lord that over you, and I've not made that much money because I've spent most of my time chasing the NBA dream, and most of the time I sort of like financed it with playing overseas. So this team offers me $400,000 net to play in Russia. And stupid Paul, I'm like, nah, I don't know, maybe I can play for the Phoenix Suns again, and I hate Russia, so I'm not going to go. But over the course of the next three days, to just to give you an idea of how ridiculous Russia is in general as a country right now, they boosted the offer to $500,000, which in my experience, I'm still owed money from Greece, so I never, yeah, $500,000 of play money as far as I'm concerned and then to $550,000. But all of these decisions are being made in like a few hours. The team is saying, we need to know if you're willing to go back to Russia, this place you hate, in four hours. Which, again, is like, maybe for you guys, because you're quicker thinkers than I, is cool. But for me, I'm like, oh, but there are these girls, and I'm so confused, and what do I do? And so I turned it down, which is probably stupid. And, okay, it's not probably stupid. 97% of you said, yeah, that was stupid, Paul. But that's okay. Because that year, instead of making $550,000 playing basketball, I lost about $15,000 making a television pilot, which was based on my book, which hadn't come out yet. So even though I didn't get a bunch of money and the pilot didn't get picked up, I have 22 minutes of television, a, a pilot, that I can show to girls and they think, wow, that guy's pretty cool. <laughs> 
so this is, this is out of learn. This is really engineering at work. I'm solving problems, couldn't get girls in college, turned down $550,000, kind of can get girls now. Good job, Dr. Bernard. <laughs> So, okay, two, two books that are kind of on my mind right now. First is this one, which is called The Black Swan. I mean, like, did, can they go in tight on that up there? No, they can't. I defeated them. Um, okay, so this, is, this book's called The Black Swan. It's by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Um, it talks about how basically everything's unpredictable. And the, the important events in our lives are unpredictable. We can't, I mean, he uses September 11th, like everyone, to sort of make this point. But it is a very good book. He's an economist, really. He used to be a trader. And the crux of it is that in our lives and in economics both, you cannot predict what's going to happen. In a similar but somewhat different vein, I recently, when I was losing my mind on the island of Menorca this year, Menorca is this tiny island off the coast of Spain. There are three islands, Ibiza, where there's like raves fueled by LSD and those sorts of things, Mallorca, which is like big and has people and is also cool, and then Menorca, which is where I was, which is boring and filled with old people. So I played basketball on this island, which is dumb, again, not smart. But I was there, kind of got in some cabin fever, was ready to lose my mind, discovered this psychologist named John Kabat-Zinn. He's sort of a pioneer of mindful meditation, which is basically appreciating what's happening now, knowing that really there's no future because it hasn't happened yet, and really there's no past because that already happened. Sounds a little spacey, but you should check it out if you ever are on an island and you want to kill yourself. So the point of both of these books, though, really, is you cannot predict what's going to happen to you. Most of you, or at least half of you, are sitting here thinking, not at this moment, but at some points during your college career, well, I've got it figured out. I'm going to get an engineering degree. I'm going to meet a nice girl or guy. We're going to get married. And then I'm going to have a family and a job, a caterpillar and whatever. Well, one of the points of this whole globalization thing is that you can't predict these things anymore. I'm from near Topeka, Kansas. There's a big Goodyear plant there. And people at Goodyear in Topeka, Kansas, don't really understand that their jobs probably aren't going to exist for very much longer. And that's a problem. Like, they are going to have to switch to something else. We're not, we don't need people to take a tire from here and put it here anymore. Because A, we could send that job somewhere else. Or B, we can make, I mean, you guys can make, I can't because I'm a basketball player and you're engineers, you're much smarter than I am. You could make a robot that can do that job. So anyway, the point is that I'm trying to make, struggling to make, is that in, as you sit there in your chairs, much like I did eight or a dozen years ago, whenever it was, you think that you know how these things are going to work. Unfortunately, you don't. So you have to be ready. You have to pay attention to what's going on around you. If I had to say two words that have sort of govern my life to this point, they would be pay attention. Because there are things happening all the time that might turn out to be really amazing opportunities, but if you're not paying attention, you don't know about it. And again, I don't want to get into like grandfatherly, oh, you should pay attention because you, I'm really smart and you're young. But you do need to kind of know what's going on. For example, I, okay, let's talk, how did I end up writing a book for Random House, which is a Fairly, maybe you've heard of it, it's a public house, publishing house, it's pretty cool. They called me to write a book, which is ridiculous, it doesn't ever happen. Um, I started writing journals when I went to Greece, mostly because I was too cheap to buy internet access, so I would type out a little journal entry and then send it to all my friends and family, which prevented me from paying the whopping sum of $5 an hour for internet or whatever. I was so poor in college, you guys know how it is, it's terrible. Um, so I would send these journals out, and, and they got to a, a little bit of a following. This was pre-lame MySpace, so I didn't have like, the access to a social network. I had to do this old school with just email. And got to be OK at it. People started to like it. And so eventually, I wind my way around a basketball career. I get to the Phoenix Suns, and they say, hey, you look to be coherent and able to complete a sentence, unlike some of our players. So do you want to write for our website? And when they said write for our website, they meant like jot down some scrawlings and we'll turn it into art and put it on the website. They did not know, however, that I had been like kind of working on this shtick as the sarcastic, self-deprecating, 
some would say self-loathing sometimes, guy. And so when I was able to start doing this, I kind of had an idea that this could turn into something because there hadn't been a lot of NBA basketball players who had written. And at that time in 2003, the whole blog concept was, maybe 2004, sorry, the whole blog concept was sort of new and exciting, whatever. So I'm not going to tell you that I am the best writer in the world. And I'm not going to tell you that I am the best at paying attention. But I did think to myself, I'm not going to be able to play basketball forever and that I might do something else with my life. Unfortunately, engineering is pretty dry and uh, there weren't a lot of professors like that guy right there. Most of my professors were boring. So I didn't have the best opinion of engineering. Earlier today I got to tour the, uh, the cave slash cube slash really cool place to play video games someday and realized that they should have shown us that at the beginning of engineering, not eight years after I got my degree, because now that's stuff I can get by. So anyway, I'm thinking to myself, I don't really want to be a basketball player for the rest of my life, so maybe I should do this well. It could lead to something else. And I did it fairly well, and it did lead to something else. Random House called and said, hey, do you want to write a book? And Do you have any ideas? And I said, oh, yeah, I have about 170,000 words I've already written, so here, let's make it a book. That's a disclaimer to say that I wrote most of this when I was a lot younger. I'm a much better writer now, so don't judge it. When I give you this copy, it's, it's just trash, really, but I'm way better now. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's the point of that is that in our world, I've seen how these things work. My best friend in college, the same one that was really smart and helped me get through Dr. Bernard's class, is now an engineer at General Electric. But he's not really an engineer. He's a salesman. He goes to places, makes sure that the various companies that GE, the monolith, is buying are doing things correctly. And so he wouldn't have predicted that when he was sitting there in these chairs like you are. You're, see this guy? He doesn't believe me. He's, he's thinking, I am going to work for Caterpillar and everything's going to be all right. And that could be. It could very well be. But unfortunately, that's probably not the case. And so along the way, as you're getting through these last years or first years or if you're a guest and you're like, I'm 70 years old. I don't care what this guy says. I already figured this out. You probably ought to develop some other skills, maybe learn how to talk to people. That would be another little nugget of wisdom I would throw at you. I didn't know how to talk to people when I was in engineering because I was an engineer, right? It's a problem. We're dorky by nature. So, but give yourself a chance in the world by learning how to communicate a little bit. And then I'll be happy because someday when I'm homeless, still trying to be an artist or writer or whatever, drinking bottle straight out of the, or wine straight out of the bottle, you can like, come back and make fun of me, and that'll be great. All right, so see how I keep going back to the notes? I'm very proud of that. How do we get through this? Well, the problem is that everything's changing, right? Well, that's okay. We can, we can deal with this. I think that, for me, it has been a matter of learning how basketball can help me in the rest of my life, which sounds sort of hokey, and I understand that. But basketball can be a metaphor for life, if you will, especially in that I learned a long time ago, I'll back up now, when I got to Iowa State, I was this hard-working, very earnest kid who played basketball really hard, and would my, my job as a freshman, Tim Floyd, would be like, Paul, you need to, you need to go in there, and I'd be like, oh, this is great. He'd be like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in, you're going to check in, for Kenny Pratt, and then you're going to foul his guy, and then you're going to come back and sit down. I'm like, yes, this is the best. <laughs> because my scholarship offers were from like North Dakota and the University of Vermont. So even being at Iowa State was a huge deal to me, even though I didn't have time because of all the engineering classes, and, and, then, and they were screaming at me in the basketball classes, I mean practices, and then there were no girls, but I didn't know how to do with them anyway, as we mentioned already. So I would get to go in and like foul somebody, or I would play really hard and get rebounds and blah, blah, blah. The problem with this is I always got hurt. Like, shocker, you throw yourself around and your bones don't like it after a while. That's a surprise, I know, to all of you. So I'm going along and I, make, I, I play for the Atlanta Hawks for 10 days, which doesn't sound like much, but is basically the culmination of my entire existence to play in the NBA. So don't make fun of it. I didn't score, though, which sucked. So the next year, I keep working really hard, and I go back, and I'm playing for the Chicago Bulls, and I make a jump shot in 
the Chicago United Arena or whatever the hell it's called. And I'm excited. Life's going well. Like, I'm getting to play a little bit, mostly because the Bulls are terrible, and they have a bunch of idiots like these guys, side basketball note, Jamal Crawford, Eddie Curry, Tyson Chandler, and we're back for everybody else who doesn't know what basketball is. I'm playing a little bit. I'm excited because we're playing against the Indiana Pacers, and I've played like 27 minutes, which is a career high at the time. I've scored four points, which is not a career high because I had scored six points against the Cleveland Cavaliers earlier in the year. That's right, six points. Don't laugh. It's six more than anybody else in this room. <laughs> so things are going all right. I've scored like 19 points that year. I'm on defense. We're getting shellacked by the Indiana Pacers. We're down by 32 points. And I see that Austin Crozier, who's this similarly large white guy who kind of can shoot, well, he's making $7 million a year. I'm making not $7 million a year. So he's about to score. He's rolling to the basket. Again, basketball terminology, I, I apologize. But he's going to catch the ball, roll to the basket, lay it in. And I am playing for my life. I'm trying to stay on this team. I think to myself, Okay, Paul, you're tired. You've played like 12 minutes in a row, which, again, is a lot because I'm used to sitting on the bench doing this. So running and guarding people, it's exhausting. So I, I rotate over, and I put my hands up in typical earnest Midwestern guy style, and I try to take a charge. Unfortunately, I'm there too late, and Austin Crozier puts his knee into my kidney and fractures it, which means blew it up, and also destroys my spleen. It breaks in the back, and there's a whole bunch of blood right here. Not on the outside, because that would have been gross, but on the inside, <laughs> which was worse because it hurt a lot. So I'm in the hospital for some time. I can't play basketball for six months. Along the way, I hook up with this man named Scott Wedman, who, anybody here know who Scott Wedman is? Yes, very nice. We had one over there, maybe? Yes, we got two. Scott Wedman played for maybe my favorite basketball team ever, which was the, well, it's the 84 to 88 Boston Celtics, basically. He was like Larry Bird's backup. Really great shooter, cool guy, had been my coach of the Kansas City Knights, which was this shoddy, shoddy minor league basketball team I had played for that year before going to the Bulls. And in coming back to Kansas City, I didn't know Scott Wedman very well, but I asked him to sort of redo my shop because, like, walking up these stairs would have exhausted me, so I had time to just stand in front of the basket and do this. And I thought, again, kind of earnest, you know, Midwestern guy, I'll work, I'll work while I'm hurt. This will be great. People, it'll be a story someday. When I'm back in the NBA and I have a $12 million a year contract, they'll be like, well, it was all because he worked really hard. Well, so I go work with Scott Wedman, and in this time that we spent, I have Scott Wedman, I've said his name like 19 times, sorry, SW, we'll say that for now, an acronym since we're in engineering lane. When SW is working with me, I learn that he's a really good basketball player back in the day. Like, he was an all-star, shot a lot of baskets that went in the basket, and that was good for me because I wanted a good teacher. And he sort of taught me new things about how to approach Basketball and not only grown life. The groans, you're, you're supposed to groan right there. You're like, oh, that's so cute. He taught him how to approach life. But he did. It, it helped. I learned about how when you shoot a basketball, you can do all the right things. You can set up and you can be mechanically pure and everything can be perfect. But if you're like tight from here to here, then you're probably going to miss because it just won't work. Or, if you don't think that you're going to make the basket, you're probably going to miss because the chances are that the rim's this big compared to this space like this, and the chances of it going in are technically pretty small. So, if you're letting yourself get in the way of all of this, it's a problem, and so you have to let go a little bit. And along the way, he showed me this book, which is called The Inner Game of Tennis. And somebody in the world back just woke up and they're like, I thought he was talking about basketball. This is ridiculous. There's a tennis ball. There's clearly a tennis ball on the cover of that book. But it's true. But it applies. This guy learned, this R. Timothy, no, sorry, W. Timothy Galloway, learned in giving tennis lessons that if you tell someone instead of, okay, you're going to hit this tennis ball and your arm's going to be here and then you're going to swing through here and your hip's going to do this and then you're going to hit the ball. Instead of doing that, you say to them, Put the ball in that corner over there. They do a lot better if you just tell them to put the ball in the corner over there. So the point being that when you tell someone, make a basket, 
their body usually knows how to do it. By the same token, if you're looking at whatever problem you're working with, whether it's some thermodynamics nonsense that's just terrible, or some decision about whether to take a job in China or whatever, sometimes you have to step back, let go, and sort of, again, sounds really hokey, but just trust yourself that you know how to make these decisions. You guys are all really smart people or you wouldn't be in here. And so you're probably not going to fail. Like, you're going to do okay. But along this unpredictability path, you're going to be faced with all these, like, insane decisions because your lives are going to get even more ridiculous than mine has been. And I've been lots of places, but you're probably going to have more options than I did. And in this, try to enjoy it a little bit. Try to trust that you're really smart. You had a, just a genius professor, really. Let's, we started off here. He was, I hated him earlier. Now he's like the Dalai Lama. We're just going to stay with that. They told me before that I started that you guys had class yesterday, but really I'm the first to talk. So I'm trying to really set them up well so that they're right up here in your self-esteem so that they can only destroy themselves. And then you'll think of me as the coolest guy ever as, throughout the rest of the class, which I think is smart by me. Because, again, just trying to sell books. So anyway, that is my spiel, as it were. I would say to you, life is unpredictable, and so learn how to, do, how to cope with that. And the way to cope with that, I think, is to realize that life is like that, enjoy whatever moment you're in, and trust that these decisions that you're going to make, these projects that you're going to have, are going to come to an okay conclusion, because you have the ability, you have this knowledge that you need, and everything will be all right. All right, so I need a question. Who had, yes, thank you. I didn't even have to ask twice. Uh, so you went the uh, can you hear me better now? Um, you went through the engineering program and stuff here. How has your education as an engineer helped you in your predictability or unpredictability or predicting unpredictability? <laughs> Very nice. It's very, I feel like there's a future in journalism there, because that's a very reporter-like question. It's also kind of a parenting question. Like, I would go to these, sometimes I would talk at basketball camps, and it's all these kids who think they're going to play in the NBA, because we all think that we're going to be professional athletes, right? right? We're, it's just the way it is. And so I'd be talking about, yeah, like, I, I've played in the NBA, and I've played in college, and the kids are eating it up. And then there would be my mother planting a question in the back. But tell them how school helped you, Paul. It's, it's been done a million times. Okay, so engineering. How has engineering helped me? Oh, okay, I was, I was scared. Sorry. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll look at it. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good. I'll, all right, got it. Yeah. The note, just so we're not, just, just in case you think there was something insidious, it said camera guys want you to come out in front of the podium. So there's that. Uh, engineering. So, um... It's a stretch, to be honest, but I think we can get there. Engineering is all about problem solving, right? And my life to this point has basically been one problem after another. Good problems, like, do you want to go play basketball here? Basically get paid to play a game. Do you want to go play basketball here? These are not, like, earth-shattering problems by any means. But what engineering, what an engineering degree does, I think, in addition to the one thing I learned in engineering that I can remember, the one thing is how to draw a straight line. It was like engineering 170 or something, and the dude's like, okay, when you draw a straight line, you're going to want to look at the pencil, but just look at the dot, and you can go straight there. And I was like, oh, wow, he's right. That's amazing. <laughs> and that's it. Five years, however much money that the basketball program or the national merit program paid, and I remember how to draw a straight line. But along the way, we also learned like, how to solve all these problems. And life continues to just throw all these problems at us, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. It makes for, makes for good stories, and maybe you'll get a book deal if you have enough of these problems. I think that, that the point of an engineering degree is to learn how to solve problems. And I have been, as I keep repeating, I get faced with these problems like, do you want to go play basketball in the next six hours? And I think under normal circumstances, when I was 17 years old, before all the engineering stuff, I would have panicked because it's just too much information. But with this degree of engineering, you're able to sort of segment, like, do I need this? Does this help me make this decision, or does it hurt me? Does the fact that I've never been to Greece help or hurt this decision? 
Uh, some could say it helps, some could say it hurts, whatever. Does the fact that I'm going to miss uh, watching episodes of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia help or hurt this decision? Probably hurts, and so that's one to the con side. <laughs> What's that? Nice. He said you can watch it online, just a tip for fellow fans of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Okay. But, and again, I, I, I was jokingly saying that it's a stretch, but I do think that, ridiculous as it may sound, some of this engineering stuff that I learned, a lot of that for me was scheduling time, as simple as that. I had either Tim Floyd or Larry Eustachie screaming at me a lot, and that made me sad. So I would schedule three hours for practice, an hour for like psychological recovery, and then I had to study because there were all these professors who thought, oh, who cares about basketball? He should be studying right now. So that's your answer, is that I think that really it's all about problem solving in, in this room, and I mean, maybe not people who are older, except that they're smarter than all of us because they're older and they've been through that. Uh, quick side note before I get to the next question. That was a good question, but it's not getting a book because I, really, I can't give the, on the first question, I can't give the book, right? I've only got two. I'm upset. I know, I'm sorry. And afterwards, I'm going to give you a back rub to make it up. <laughs> okay, so quick side story. I was telling these guys, I think, when I was a freshman in college, scared out of my mind, again, looked like I was 14, whatever, I went in to some of my professors to tell them that I was going to have to miss class sometimes because we had games, going to have practices at weird hours at times, and that I was going to need some help like rescheduling tests and all that sort of thing. And I went into one class, maybe calculus, and the guy was like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. And I go into, I don't know, chemistry, and the guy's like, yeah, that's cool. So I go into the engineering, the hardcore engineering class, and I walk in and I'm like, okay, sir, uh, I'm going to need to tell you that I'm on the basketball team and that I'm going to miss class sometimes. And he's like, whoa, 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 stop right there. We have a basketball team? <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is going to be tough. So thankfully, there are cool professors like these two to, to help us the rest of it. Okay, next question. Right here. You can just say it. I'll repeat it. If you, or we get... What's my opinion on high school athletes going pro? Well, this is actually, we can address this from, in the, the terms of globalization, actually. Recently, there's a kid named Brandon Jennings who was committed to the University of Arizona. He decided because he took the SAT and did badly, and then, you know what? I'm, I'm using restraint, and I had a tangent that I was going to do, but I'm not going to do it because it was just taking us way up top. So we're going we're gonna to save that for later. Remind me later, and I'll try to... It has to do with the SAT. Okay, so anyway, he takes the SAT, doesn't do spectacular. They make him take it again, but his improvement is too much, so the NCAA is not going to let him play or whatever. So he's like, okay, screw you. I'm going to Italy to play for half a million dollars or whatever. The reason he had to do this was because the NBA recently put a rule in saying that you had to be 19 years old to declare for the NBA draft, which is where NBA teams pick prospective players, and then they play for that team. So this guy outwits them, which I think is great, because the NCAA is the most exploitative organization in the history of exploitative organizations, except for, I was going to say the Catholic Church, but there are lots of Catholics here, so I, I don't want to do that. That's it's just it's me. Here's what the NCAA does. The NCAA, the NCAA accepts $6 billion from CBS, the television network. $6 billion. It's about... It turns out, because the contract is a course of 11 years, that's like $550 million a year to televise just the NCAA tournament. Yet the players, like this guy, not that people were tuning in to watch me, but you know, it's, it helps the analogy if we're talking about me. They don't pay us. They didn't pay us anything. And that's fine. You guys are like, oh, we don't care, spoiled athletes, blah, 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 blah. But if you're a guy like Brandon Jennings, who people are actually tuning in to watch play basketball, it doesn't make sense to go to college. Why go to college? So he made the right decision. Maybe he had some pre-engineering classes. I don't know. Maybe Dr. Bernard actually taught him in wherever he went to high school. And he says, hmm, why don't I just go to Europe, make half a million dollars, and then play in the NBA next year, which is kind of genius, I think. I, don't, I can't argue with high school basketball players playing in the NBA. Most of the guys I went to college with weren't here for college. Like, they weren't going to get a degree in anything. So really it was about basketball. It's a sham, basically, that... The basketball team is attached to the university because, at least in my experience, maybe this isn't true at Duke or UCLA or someplace where they can get guys that are smart and good. They got 
Here they get people like me who are kind of smart, but not so good, or guys who are really good, but not so smart. <laughs> so in my experience, this whole like student athlete thing, it's, it's completely bogus, but that's, we can talk about that at another time. So I say good for them for making money, making the right decision, and going to play basketball. Side note, and then you're next, for sure. Uh, when I was in college, this is student athlete again. When I was in college, I was here for five years, and I played with 49 other basketball players, which means that, on average, there were 10 new players a year, which is really the continuity that you always dream of as a kid, like team building, stuff like that. It's, that's not what college athletics is about. It's about money, just like everything else. Um, right up there. I did. Very good. He asked me if I played a Hawkeye, that would be an Iowa Hawkeye, in the movie Glory Road. They didn't have any Iowa State parts, so I went to the next best thing that I could. So I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of the Hawkeyes, I have to apologize again. Because tonight, there's a man, a very funny man, named Chuck Klosterman, who wrote the introduction to my book. Um, again, power of the internet. I've read lots of Chuck's books and always was kind of a fan. And then when my book was kind of in the works, I'm like, who could I get to write the forward and thus help me sell more books? Because I'm greedy. And I'm thinking to myself, why not ask Chuck Klosterman? I just shot in the dark. Because of, again, globalization, really, and the internet, I'm able to find his address, send him a note, and say, Chuck, will you write the forward of my book? He says, can you get me $2,000? I said, absolutely, from the publishing house, not from me. And he writes the forward to my book, which is really cool. So again, similar to Professor Bernard finding me, this is the power of the world we live in. The reason I said that about the Iowa Hawkeyes and the apology is that tonight, while you're listening to me drone on and on about basketball and problem solving, Chuck Klosterman is lecturing at the University of Iowa, so sorry that you have to listen to me. And I don't mean, I'm not being like self-deprecating because I would much rather listen to Chuck Klosterman than myself. So I'm, I mean that, like, I apologize. Okay, next question, up there. Okay. That's, that's a good question. You get a book. I'm going to throw it at you, too. Throw, give that to that girl. Uh, I have been hard on Iowa State and my engineering degree in the past. Hard on Iowa State only because it was my fault. I probably didn't have the best time here because I was so inundated with just being screamed at, mostly. That was the problem. Like, I was getting yelled at by the coaches a lot, and it drove me crazy. As to the engineering program, I took exactly one English class in my college career, and it was technical writing. I wrote a book. Do, is that, does that seem strange, right? Like, maybe we should teach people how to write, ever? Uh, it would have helped. I would have sold a lot more. Like, New York Times bestseller right across the top if I had in one English class. Just kidding. It wasn't their fault. I, I am serious, though, in that I think there are serious problems with making people take these classes on these archaic computer programming languages or whatever. I took Fortran. Do they still teach that? I don't know what that is even. Okay. Did that, has that helped me at all? No. Not even a little bit. Now, that's fine. It's not about, again, the stupid kid in class always says, why am I taking algebra? I'm never going to use this. And really, it's not about learning algebra. It's learning the process of learning. And it's true that you do need to, and that's the power, I suppose, of learning Fortran or whatever. But you could sprinkle in a little English once in a while. And maybe, I don't know what graphic design is like necessarily, but I think that there is this idea that colleges are technical schools and you can just train guys to go plug in the memory cards or whatever they did in the 1950s for computers. And it's not true. People need to, to be able to communicate is probably number one. In fact, Really? They should probably have more in English classes, more classes on learning how to talk. In fact, they should probably teach Spanish and Japanese and Russian instead of teaching you 
differential equations? Did, have I used that? No, of course I'm not, I'm not working for GE, but am I really going to use differential equations ever? Probably not. But I might use being able to speak Spanish. Like that's probably more helpful. So if you're going to be training people to go on, I think that it would be nice to just, just like little pixie dust of English classes, maybe a little psychology, something that like helps you become a slightly more well-rounded person. And I guess as I look back on my college experience, that's maybe the problem I have with it most, is that I didn't, I wasn't exposed to new ideas. It's true that you learn to learn by taking Fortran, but you also learn how to learn if you're studying Dickens. You learn how to write a, write, a book report or whatever. So there are different ways to get around this besides just throwing numbers at you and making you want to kill yourself. Uh, up there in the pink. We're going to get a microphone, oh, microphone to you. Yes. <laughs> I did not repeat her question well because it was long. And, no, well, you got a book, so don't complain. But, <laughs> but it was long. Okay. I wanted to follow up on your mention of the importance of learning foreign languages. So I'm assuming you did not take any foreign languages at Iowa State? No. And I didn't have time. Like, yeah, in my spare time between the engineering 397,012. Yeah, go ahead. Well, your strategies then for communicating with your teammates and your coaches and so on when you, when you uh, played abroad, what, how did you handle that? Uh, it's a good question. I'm not going to give you a book because, again, right after the other one, it would, be, it would seem staged. Uh, <laughs> how did I deal with communication? Um, most of the time, it's rough because we're not talking about normal communication where I can sit here and just have a conversation. You're talking about on the fly, on the basketball court communication, which is like, hey man, that guy's about to kill you with that back screen and your neck's going to be broken. And it's hard to say that in Spanish, even if I had studied Spanish for four years. But there is, and as I, when I write, a lot of times it's complaining. And I'm sorry for that, but... One of the strategies of my life is that when I am sad or depressed about something, I write it down. And sometimes that gets to be sort of fun and interesting, and sometimes it gets to be too much, and people write book reviews on Amazon saying, this guy just whines, and I hate him. But anyway, the things that I do complain about are such things as the language barrier, because it is annoying to live someplace like that and not really be able to communicate. Um, the strategies really are hope that they speak English, is strategy A, number one. And two is learn the important words. I guess there's nothing, I can't say that I've ever done anything particularly profound, but this, again, hokey, but the language of basketball overrides. All, no. Uh, it's, it, it maybe isn't as important in my world of basketball as it would be if I were making heart stints or something like that. Like, if that guy doesn't catch the pass that I throw at him because he's not looking because he doesn't understand that I'm speaking English, Nobody dies. So I don't know that I've put so much emphasis on it. It has probably screwed up my interpersonal relationships with girls who didn't speak my language, but it hasn't, you know, it hasn't ended my career by any means. Paul, we've got a question from an off-campus student. Nice. Our remote audience would like to know, what do you think will it mean for a basketball player to be globalized in 50 years? What will it mean for a basketball player to be globalized in 50 years. Did I get that right? OK. Um, first of all, we were, uh, we were actually talking this afternoon about 50 years from now. This goes along the lines of this book, Black Swan, You Can't Predict Anything, and also goes along the lines of probably why I will never be a particularly effective color commentator, because I'm not willing to stand there and yell and be like, the Ohio State Buckeyes are number one forever. Like, I don't care about that. It's just dumb. So I'm not into predicting things. However, I think we should also keep in mind that as we talk about unpredictability, there's nothing that says that basketball or professional sports are even going to be popular in 50 years. It's, we assume now, because athletes, Latrell Sprewell's making $8 million and saying he can't feed his family or whatever, we think that it's always going to be like that, that we're always going to hold athletes in this high esteem. But 110 years ago, was, did anybody care about the Boston Celtics? No, because basketball didn't even exist at that time. So 50 years from now, will basketball or sports or the fact that Iowa State plays South Dakota State, is that right? 
tomorrow night? Yeah. Nobody's going to care because it will be reduced again to intramural status. So, to be honest, I hate to be the copper router, but I don't know. I don't have any idea because these things are very fickle. Even when Scott Wedman, my guru, played basketball in the late 70s and early 80s in the NBA, he made a comfortable living, but he was by no means a multimillionaire. And when there's money attached to things, it's important to be globalized or globally conscious. I don't know that it's so important if you're only making $10,000 a year and you're playing against the Goodyear super tires or whatever the teams might be at that time. So oh, sorry, I'm going to say I don't know. Right here, in the middle. How do you define success? Oh, wow. It's a hard hitter. How do I define success? Um, OK, I'm supposed to be talking about globalization, but we're going to have to take a little tour off the beaten track. And this goes more into, let's say, this, the John Kabat-Zinn style. I think that in my world, in basketball, in writing books, in making television pilots, which, by the way, Dumb move by me. I should have brought that, and we could have showed it on the big screen. We could have had the world premiere right here, even though it would have been illegal, because we're not supposed to show it for three years, because Fox has the rights, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, in these worlds, it's very easy to seek the approval of others. We all do that all the time, right? Like, that's, we're kind of hardwired to worry about what other people think. That guy right there in the Minnesota Twins is like, hmm, I wonder if that hot girl from the party the first night I was here is still thinking about me. But... Really, that doesn't matter. That's not going to change whether she's thinking about him, unfortunately. I wish that I could change these things just by thinking about them, but I can't. So I think, again, I'm only 30, and I'm not by no means any sort of like genius or um, sage, if you will. But I think that the point of the, the idea of success is thinking that you succeed yourself and not worrying about if other people you think, if other people think you succeed. If that means graduating from Iowa State with an engineering degree, if that equals success to you, then you've succeeded. To me, playing in the NBA was the goal. From the time I was that tall, that dude, he's watching something on his computer in the middle of class. Is that acceptable behavior in college now? Really? We do that? God, that must drive you insane. I slept through his class, which, but I think sleeping is less intrusive. OK. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to sell you down the river, but I was just, I was just shocked because we didn't have computers, period. Uh, so <laughs> success, to me, it sounds really kind of hokey, but the important thing is, what is your goal? What do you want to do? And if that is to fly to the moon, if you get to fly to the moon, you've succeeded. If that is to marry rich, then you've succeeded, and nobody can really tell you otherwise. And again, I'm... I'm qualified probably to talk about basketball and writing and maybe globalization as it pertains to those things, but I've also learned a little bit about failure, most of all, because I've failed lots of times, like lots of times. I've been cut by the Atlanta Hawks and the New Orleans Hornets and the Los Angeles Lakers and the Phoenix Suns and the Atlanta Hawks again. So I know about like complete abject failure where I go back to my room I fall on the bed and I cry. As a 25-year-old, or however old I was at that time, male, I cry my eyes out because I have failed at the only thing I ever wanted to do. To me, then, success was making an NBA roster. And I did that with the Phoenix Suns. Now, that success only applies to my life as a basketball player. I've kind of moved on. I'm deciding what I will do with the rest of my life. I'm deciding if I'll play basketball. I've had two knee surgeries and an ankle surgery in the last two years, so looks like the basketball like, ship is sort of sailing away into the distance, sadly. So I'm trying to decide now, what does success mean to me in the future? Does that mean writing a novel, which incidentally I'm working on, which all writers say, and you have to be like, yeah, sure, Paul, great, it's going to be fantastic. Because that's what's what we need is a self-esteem boost because we're shallow. Um, to answer your question in one sentence, success is succeeding at whatever you say you want to be good at? I like that question, and it's, it's nominated for a book. Remind me. Okay. Yes. With all the information available about 
uh, prospective employees, or in your case, uh, prospective basketball players for other countries, do you think it's easy for employers to overlook a well-qualified candidate in term in relation to a more qualified candidate that just doesn't have as much information out there? Yeah, that's, that's actually a fairly profound question as it applies to my own life, in a way. Um, I grew up in a town of 700 people, and funny thing, they don't scout towns of 700 people that well for basketball. Like, shocking news, I know. Um, and so, in, in those days, this was 12 years ago, there's no internet to speak of. I mean, there is, but it's not by any means as prevalent as it is today. And people are basically relying on word of mouth. And the interesting thing about this, the time that we find ourselves in now, is that we're at this weird combination of some people are really into the globalization, like interconnectedness thing, and other people aren't. And some of those people who are into it happen to be basketball GMs, and some of them who are 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 GMs are not into it, also happen to be basketball GMs. And it can be frustrating as a basketball player or a prospective employee to not know, like, which guys are paying attention, which guys have all the information. I've been released from teams I should have made, I've made teams I should have been cut from, and a lot of that is because there are systems in place in basketball, but not only in basketball, but in academics, in probably dentistry, I don't know, where the, the proverbial good old boy network, where a guy will trust his quote unquote instincts more than he trusts the statistics. There's a great book, there are two good books about this phenomenon, economics as it applies to sports. One's called Moneyball, the other one is by Michael Lewis, I think. There's another one called Wages of Wins, which is not as well written, but is actually kind of cool. And it, it talks about how basketball, baseball people make personnel decisions completely on just nonsensical reasons like, well, he looks like this guy who used to play, so maybe he'll be the next Lenny Dykstra or whatever. Instead of saying, well, this guy can't hit a curveball, his average is 0 0.91 against a curve, and so maybe we shouldn't draft him. And those things are still present in basketball, baseball, and I'm sure in the world of engineering. I think it will be a matter of time before it is completely streamlined. Some of us, those of us who are not particularly, I mean, I'm, okay, don't get me wrong, I'm a pretty good basketball player, but it was kind of nice. There were times when I worked my way onto teams and I shouldn't have. That was cool. In the future, that won't happen because everything will be, there's a razor thin edge of competitiveness if you have all of the information. So, unfortunately for you guys, you're not at that time when the best people are always going to get the jobs. Sometimes, you're going to get screwed, sorry. And that's the way of it. Um, but it's better than it used to be, probably. Right here. Thank you guys for, answer, or for asking questions. I was joking before the class that if I had a bunch of freshmen, and this was like the second day of school forever, everybody would sit there like, hmm, please don't talk to me. So I'm glad that we've got some upperclassmen here who are confident and able to ask me questions. Okay. This is a uh, lot of basketball question for overseas. Okay. Um, especially with like the Olympics and U.S. basketball, uh, with Kobe Bryant being so big, and I know like Josh Chill just signed an overseas contract. Right. LeBron James saying that he might look into that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see like overseas cultures changing where American er, American soccer, like football, used to be the big thing? Wait. So we're asking a, um, so, overseas or European culture right. embracing we're, basketball more? Right. Is that what you mean? Right. Okay. Um, Good question. Well, I've been asked this because when I was promoting the book, I was on the radio a fair amount, like doing the sports shows and stuff. And so people have come back to me and they'll call me and say, hey, Paul, what do you think about? Because now I'm the international basketball like guy. I'm the, like, if it was CNN, I'd be the dude who comes on in a tie and says, well, I think that melanoma is caused by grapes. So now I'm that guy only as applied to basketball and overseas basketball. So this year... For whatever reason, actually, the reason is, it's pretty simple. The Euro is really strong. European teams offer contracts wherein the player doesn't have to pay taxes. So let's say, for example, you're offered 3 million euros in a, for a team in Greece, right? 
that's four and a half million dollars. The team pays your taxes, which cuts out four and a half million dollars. So you're really making the equivalent of nine million dollars here, right? So three million euros becomes nine million dollars because of taxes and the strength of the euro. So it comes down to, side note, they don't ever really pay those taxes. They just go to the government and say, hey, uh, we're going to pay those taxes, right? And the government says, sure, buddy. And then they get better players. So it's really not the most non-corrupt system ever. Um, <laughs> But anyway, it is, it is interesting that that's happening, and, and it is probably based on the euro more than anything. I don't know that it will continue. It depends on what happens with the euro versus the dollar. Um, it's, it's cool, I think, just because it allows people to see more of the world, even if they're not there. Little piece of advice. If you guys can go some other country in your post-college time, just go. Don't go work for... Name a company, please, somebody. Cargill. Cargill. Don't go work for Cargill the first year out. Go to Europe and just like hang out for a while. Because I've been amazed at the perspective I've gained on the rest of the world from living over there. Now, granted, I've only lived, I've lived in, in Barcelona, uh, Menorca, the aforementioned terrible island, uh, Kazan, Russia, the terrible place in Russia, and Athens, Greece. So I can't say, I, mean, I haven't lived in uh, Taipei. But... I've lived in some places, and it has really, really helped me, and I mean this like with all, with all sincerity. When you finish this engineering degree, or whatever degree, or even if you're 55 years old and you've never been out of the country, go live over there for a while, because you'll understand better what happens here. And I think that it's cool to see these Americans going over there, because it makes people, where's Athens, Greece? I don't even know. When I get this, I'm a fairly smart guy. Pretty, I'm okay. When I graduated from high school and college, I didn't know which came first, the Roman Empire or the Greek Empire. Seriously. Like, I don't know that, probably not all of you know this question, because, again, engineering, no social studies, that's for sure. So, the chance to go there, now I know that uh, it's uh, Greece and then uh, Rome, which is, you know, really, really important for me to know that. But, I say that only as kind of jokingly to make fun of them, but also in seriousness that I've learned a lot just by being away for a while. So... If you get the chance, go over there. Especially you, because you asked the question. Right here. You have to wait for the mic. Could have sworn that I had some water. Does anybody have water that they could share with me? No, you don't, don't go anywhere. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Yes, good. Very good. Now you're going to hear gurgle, gurgle, gurgle while this water goes. Yep, I'm coming back. Coming back. Okay, question here. So it seems like you've had to make a lot of just really fast, really big decisions, and I'm sure you know other people that have and that's a product of people being able to find someone halfway across the world and then instantly communicate with them and say, hey, we need you now. Do you just accept that? Do you think that's fair that people have to, you know, face those decisions, or is it you just go along with it? Um, did everybody hear the question okay? Any no problems? Okay. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> that's really what we're all going to learn here is that they don't care. And I think when we get into these industries that are discussing or are analyzing big sums of money, they don't care what Paul Shirley is going to do. They, they just want to know, can we get a player who's going to help us get people into the seats who might buy jerseys and make us money? So whether I like it or not, it's going to continue to happen. You're right. It's tough. And it, it's, it's going to be tough for you guys because the rest of the world wants to catch up. Like, they all want what we have, not from a cultural standpoint, because, again, is our culture so great? Because, seriously, that guy right there, he's, he looks like he's about to pass out. He's, he's, look, he's watching YouTube, for sure. And that's our culture. It's just you sit there like this. So we're, we're not exporting our culture. It's not that great. But they want what we have in terms of comfort and all of these things. And as we go forward, Thomas Friedman would argue against this. He says that everyone can win, maybe. But I think that it will be some evening out. And we're going to have to be ready to make these fast decisions. So, again, I don't like it because it's hard for me to say to my friends, like, last poker game because i got to go Kazan for a year. But that's the way it is. Paul, I think we have another off-campus one. Nice. We have at least two off-campus viewers, and I am excited. That's a good thing. We have quite a few yeah. viewers, Paul. Well, we have seen the reactions to the Olympics in China and the sports there being politicized. How do you think sport is affecting globalization and politics in particular? How do I think sports 
is affecting globalization and, and politics. Um, wow, that's a heavy question. Uh, da, 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 da. I, I guess it's sort of like the opposite of the question that we got, how is globalization affecting sports? Now how is sports affecting globalization? I think it, it makes people more aware, I suppose, of different places, and as we talked about before, that's cool. I mean, now people know that Australians can play basketball too, and, and, and that's kind of interesting. Um, I guess as far as it affects politics, I'm, I'm always interested in the money behind all of this. Like, where does the money I make come from? Uh, in Russia, for example, it's from these oil barons who, this is all conjecture and rumor, so keep that in mind. I'm going to say this, but I don't know it for, for like, God's honest fact, but this is what they tell me. In Russia, at the fall of, like, communism and the whole Soviet Union thing, all of these rich dudes just snatched a bunch of oil companies. And when Putin or Yeltsin or somebody came into power, he said, that's cool as long as you sponsor sports teams, which is a weird leap of faith. Like, <laughs> you can steal, but it's fine as long as you sponsor sports teams. I don't know where that comes from. But it is a little suspicious that in this country, these people have so much money. I mean, they're, it's just, they're just raining money at basketball players, hockey players. When I was in... Kazan. One day I walked downstairs from this hotel I was in, and sitting there is this guy who looks like he might speak English, so I'm asking him what's going on, and blah, blah, blah. And it turns out his, it's, his name is Vincent Le Cavalier, who's one of the best hockey players in the world now. I didn't know that because I don't know anything about hockey. And so I'm talking to this guy. It turns out the NHL was on strike that year, and this team in Kazan had a budget of $47 million to, for a hockey team. Just why not put a team in Kazan, Russia, and have and just pay $47 million and have Vincent Le Cavalier, who I think was MVP of the finals last year or something like that. So there is money to be had, and I can't imagine where it's coming from because there aren't that many people watching the games. The TV contracts aren't huge. The sponsorship deals aren't that huge. And so it does interest me how this all works. I think a lot of it does have to do with governments and them wanting to like prop up their country self-esteem or whatever. There are also interesting connections between governments and sport, which, again, I don't totally understand, but I will just sort of pass along this information. When I was in Greece, again, not trying to lord it over you, I signed for $100,000 my first contract out of college. It's a lot of money when I'm coming from, like, walking through Target and knowing that I have $3 in my wallet. Like, that was a big deal. So I signed this contract. I'm excited about it. They pay me in cash every time, which is weird. Month number two, <laughs> month number two, they're like, we're going to pay you half. And I'm like, okay, because what am I going to say? Like, no, I'll, I'll take the half. And they start spitting this word, which anybody of Greek descent here? No one? Like, not even a little bit? Okay, the word is avrio, which means tomorrow. So I'd be like, so when am I going to get the rest of my money? Avrio. What? But no, you said that yesterday. No, no, it's tomorrow. Avrio, tomorrow. Um, long story short, the end of the year comes, the team owes me $105,000 because of some ridiculous bonus or whatever. They've paid me $52,000. You guys are smart. You've been through some math. You know that that's not enough. That's <laughs> insufficient funds. So I'm like, well, obviously, it's in the contract. They're going to pay me this money, right? My agent's like, yeah, don't worry. We've got a lawyer. It'll be fine. So we get the lawyer. We, I, probably somebody pays him, not me, because I'm already mad. And we, we sue the team. We win the lawsuit, obviously, because it says on the contract, we will pay Paul Shirley $100,000, and they didn't do it. Like, that's not hard to figure out. Any judge could make that determination. They appeal the lawsuit, which I think is weird, because it's like, you said you'd pay it, you didn't pay it, it's not difficult. We win the appeal because, again, it's just dumb. <laughs> but as I stand before you today, that team still owes me $52,000, and they will never pay it to me because... The teams in Greece that year were in sort of dire financial straits. A few years before this, who knows who Dominique Wilkins is? <sighs> All right, this one we, did, we connected on Dominique Wilkins. We're here. We're now we're, we're together. Dominique Wilkins, the twilight of his career, went and played for a team in Greece called Panathinaikos for like $2 million a year. This sort of increased interest in Greek basketball. People started coming to games. It got really big for a while. But by the time I got there, Typical Paul Shirley move. Everything has sort of collapsed, and 
Like, these vandals broke out the windows of our practice facility, so we would practice in the same temperature as it was outside, which was not warm, and so it sucked. We were wearing stocking caps. But anyway, the bottom fell out of this market, and so there wasn't enough money to pay me. The team goes to the government and says, look, what can we do? We don't have the money. The government says to the team, here's what you do. If you promise never to do it again, we'll forgive you all of your debts, and we'll move forward. Hints and thus, Paul Shirley does not have $52,000, and he will never get it. Uh, so that's how globalization has, sports has affected politics. Global, I don't know. That was, <laughs> that was just me telling a story, because I, didn't know, I did not know the answer, because that question was too hard. But, but thank you for it. Um, yes. No, right in the red hair. I'm, I don't mean to say this to be mean, but you're the one who reminded me of Chuck Klosterman, who's over in Iowa City talking because you look like him. Which isn't bad. He's a good-looking dude. I am not offended. Okay, good. Glad. Then again, I don't, I don't know Chuck, though, either. So, uh, here at Iowa State, I've been given the opportunity to work on a senior design project with two um, international students from China. And you can, you know, readily make the connection that cultural differences really play in there and how you deal with people in that kind of a problem-solving setting. Right. Can you give some examples of how cultural differences have affected the players that you play with um, throughout the world? Yes, I can. Um, in Greece, they listened to just, just terrible folk music, and I could not get behind that. It was just, just the worst, so we could never connect on a musical front. That was just awful. Um, I mean, there haven't been, there have been a lot of, like, uncircumcised guys, and I thought that was like, wow! But other than that... <laughs> Don't, it's not, we can talk about that. She's like, God, I can't believe you said that. It's just, that's just anatomy, culture. We can talk about those things. Come on. Um, other than that, I, I, I would say that most, there is a, an overriding basketball culture that is sort of understood the world over. Guys have known, if we talk globalization, I've, I've talked to various players who would tell me, yeah, I used to watch every game of the week. They would show one NBA game in, say, Bulgaria every week. I had a Bulgarian teammate this year. That's why I say that. And so his only access to the world of basketball, as it is displayed by the United States, is this one game of the week. So strangely enough, the, the cultural stuff doesn't matter so much because these guys are already steeped in the world of basketball culture. The problem is I don't really like basketball culture because I'd rather talk about, like, Interpol or something like that. The band, not the international crime-fighting organization. But, <laughs> like, they kind of understand how these things are going to work. They all sort of already have the baggy shorts, and they, they know how these things go. And when it comes to me playing basketball, that's not really what I want to talk about off the court, but they get it. And so, really, all we need to do is connect on a basketball level. I'm probably not going to discuss Barack Obama with my Bulgarian teammates, so we can talk about basketball, go to the bar and get hammered and throw rocks at these pigeons that lived on this cliff up above. <laughs> I was just reminiscing a little bit. Um, I didn't ever do that, Mom. I was just fiction. <laughs> okay, next question. Right here. <laughs> he said, how do you deal with failure? How have you best learned to deal with failure besides crying like a little girl? Not that there's anything wrong with crying. I like it. Crying is great. Um, uh, to deal with failure, writing about it helps, I think. And I'm serious. Like, I, prior to leaving college and going to Greece, I had never been encouraged to creatively write anything. Not in high school, not in college, nothing. And I'm pretty self-deprecating, and my book's not the best book in the world, but it's kind of funny, and some people have said that it's okay. So apparently I have some talent to write, so it seems that somebody along the way should have said, hmm, maybe you should try writing something down. Like, it never even occurred to me to write. And I say that to you, not because I think that you're all going to write books someday, maybe you will, but I mean that if you are ever in trouble, like if you're ever struggling with things, write it down and it will help. It goes away, and it's fantastic. Um, but I think that, that some of the things that, I've gone, that I went through in college 
not necessarily in engineering. I failed a fair amount in engineering, but I failed more in basketball. And the failures in basketball are much easier to detect. If I miss a shot, get my shot blocked, get dunked on by Kelvin Cato in practice, everybody knows about it. And so that has sort of allowed me to learn how to, okay, I fell on the ground and I look like a jackass, now get up and do it again. And they say, people who know these things, say that the, really the only way to learn is to fail many, many times. And I've, I guess I've learned a lot because I've failed a lot. So it is a little hokey and overused, but I think that you have to look at those failures as an opportunity to be like, okay, what do I do differently? You can give up, but nobody's interested in that, and you'll never tell interesting stories, and that guy will never ask you to come back and like, talk about those stories if you give up. But you can say, well, that sucked, and I hate the fact that that guy just dunked on me and cut my chin, and now everybody knows that he dunked on me because I'm bleeding as I run down the court, but I'm going to go in the training room and get stitched up and come back out here and try it again. Yes? Um, it sounds like you've had a lot of experience adapting, not just, you know, from Iowa to Greece, then Kansas City, then back, but also going from, you know, basketball and engineering to writing. Uh, how did you adapt to all these different changes and situations? Well, I, I, that's an important question because that's sort of what we're, we're all talking about here is that it is important to be able to adapt. And that's when I talk about this idea of paying attention. I think that's all about adapting, like knowing that if you fail at, not, not pointing at you because you're going to fail, I'm saying just because you asked the question. If you fail at working for Cargill, then you will be able to do other things. And I, I guess that while you're young, you need to test yourself a fair number of times so that you know that if you do fail, you can still do something else. Um, where One thing that I've always struggled with when I play basketball overseas versus playing in the NBA. In the NBA, they want players who are really good at one thing. They want a guy who can just block shots, and then they can pull him out, and he doesn't have to do that anymore. Because they don't want people who think. It's kind of like the Army. They just want people to plug into the various spots and then do your job, go home. In European basketball, it's more about being creative, about being able to do lots of different things. The problem with this is that I've butted my head against the NBA a lot because I always wanted to play in the NBA. It's, I'm American, it's American League. Larry Bird was really cool when I was young and I wanted to be Larry Bird and so wanted to play in the NBA. Was probably more well suited to play in Europe because over there, much like I am, the players are taught to be kind of good at lots of different things. And so I would say in this world of engineering or writing or basketball or whatever, Unless you are just some sort of savant and you're going to be the best at whatever you're doing, try to get kind of good at lots of things and see what develops. Don't try to be really good at one thing. Again, unless, I mean, if you're going to develop the next iPod, then do that. But otherwise, you're probably going to be better off, like, again, the whole paying attention thing, like paying attention to what things might help you in the long run. So, in this world, I think that the European basketball model is probably better than the NBA basketball model. Oh. Okay, good. Yeah, he has a question. Okay. Okay, I'm from the English department, and right. I teach that technical communication class that you had. Oh, right. Was, um, <laughs> uh, it looks like you're proud of it. Well, uh, we had all the engineers today at lunch, yeah. and they stayed awake. Huh. Um, my question is, at this point in your career, what gives you more personal satisfaction, um, being an international basketball player or being a writer? And then secondly, in social circles, mm -hmm. what gets you further saying that you're an international basketball player or a writer? Or writer, okay. Um, hmm. What gives me, okay. Uh, I would say that because from the time that, well, when I was four, I wanted to be a professional baseball player and play for the Kansas City Royals. But after that, I broke my nose. It got smashed against the side of my face, which is why it's big like it is now. And I got really tall, and I was like, well, maybe basketball will be good. So from that age on, I wanted to play in the NBA. That was the goal. And it never occurred to me, as I mentioned, to be a writer. So 
to this point, making it to the NBA has been the most satisfying thing that I've done. However, on a day-to-day -day basis, as I get older, see that basketball isn't going to maybe fulfill me for the rest of my life, I am beginning to derive more satisfaction out of being able to make a really good point and making a few wisecracks in between and seeing it on a printed page. Like, that's really cool. So I guess in the first 30 years of my life, basketball was more important. In the next, however long I get to live, 64 more years. I'm living to be 94, I decided. Uh, I think writing will do it. Now, when it comes to social circles, I always thought that with girls, the basketball thing would be great, but they tend to think that you're kind of a man whore if you're a basketball player. <laughs> Writer is much safer. They're going to be like, well, he's sensitive, so that's going to be awesome. <laughs> then again, if we're talking to old dudes, it's basketball for sure. They don't care about writing. Back there. Um, every time you meet someone new uh, and you're starting to talk to them and they ask you, what do you do? Like, what's your job? Right. What do you say? And uh, does... Every time that conversation come up, you have to explain your entire career. That's a that's a good question. I think you're you're right now. You're in line for the book for sure. Right. It's just paperback though. I'm sorry. I only have love it. Okay, but you're you're first in line. Sorry. So who who is who is right there? I'm sorry. I apologize again. Back rub for you too. Uh, uh, okay. This has been a long running battle in my life because you're right, and my mother knows this. Like if if somebody asks my mom, so what's Paul doing? She's like. Why don't we talk about Dan, who's in medical school? Because that's way easier. <laughs> My life, yes, is complicated. Uh, I usually say that there's usually the term ridiculous in there because I say, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I'm a professional basketball player. Because even though I'm really tall, people are like, nah, it's not possible. And you, then you want to say, like, well, Again, that lady thought I was eight feet tall, so how many people do you think are this tall that could be roaming the earth right now? Like, I probably play professional basketball. It's not that shocking. But it is true that it's a long, it's just the worst story ever. Like, why are you in Kansas City? We don't have a professional basketball team, but we don't play all year round. And why do you have, why, why do you have time to write a book? Because we don't practice all day, every day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know what I'm going to... It's a good question. What will I introduce myself as whenever this basketball career comes to end? Which could be this year, could be in two years, but it'll be soon. I guess retired professional athlete? I think that'll throw people off. Especially if I have this just ridiculously gross beard right now. Then they'll be like, yeah, he's just pitched in and he doesn't care anymore. He's retired. I like that. So we'll go with that for now. Okay, next question. Right here. All right. Uh, I'm a huge NBA fan. Really? You're like the one person in Iowa. By the way, this is, I think this is going to be the last question, right? Maybe one more? No, we'll, go, we'll go one more. Yeah. I'm a huge NBA fan, so I would like to ask an NBA question. Okay. If you had to pick four NBA players to play on a team with you, oh, wow. who would you pick and why would you pick them? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Nobody else in this room is going to care, so you and I are just going to have to talk right here. <laughs> they're, I'm gonna be, they're going to be like, God, this is the worst. Um, Steve Nash is my point guard, for sure. Obviously. Um, and then we got to, Tim Duncan has to play, right? Because he's a great guy. And just really, he's just really solid. Um, we need somebody crazy in there, too. Like, this just, because I've always, here's what I always thought. I, I maybe mentioned this in the book or some column I've written, but when I was growing up, I always thought that basketball teams were going to be this, like, it was going to be like the coolest thing ever. And after games, we'd all go out and have dinner and then chase girls together or whatever. I don't mean that in like a, like, you know, creepy way, but just, you know, how guys do. And it wasn't like that because nobody ever hangs out. The other thing I always thought was it going to be this totally, like, debaucherous free-for-all and people were going to be doing cocaine in the bathroom stall at halftime when, in fact, they're, like, leading prayer circle before the game. And I'm like, really? This is boring. <laughs> so, so I always like to have somebody crazy on my team. So we're picking Ricky Davis, even though he played at the University of Iowa. Because that dead dude's insane. So he gets to play just for like comic relief. Like you need somebody to loosen things up. Which means that we need a power forward. Let's see. Uh, man, let's bring Kevin McHale out of retirement. Okay, he's, he's on my team just because he's just fun to watch. And because I wanted those guys to know what I was talking about. By the way, 
Kevin McHale is not the most famous basketball player in the world, but he's pretty famous. And one time this year, one of my, one of the staff in Menorca ordered some like retro jerseys, globalization at work. He was able to go online to eBay, order the jersey. Some dude in Thailand slapped the little numbers on there, sent it to the US and sent it to him. And one of my teammates, who's, again, the guy, the Bulgarian guy, who's the guy, he knows everything about basketball. He's never heard of Kevin McHale. So apparently, globalization failed in about 1985. <laughs> yes, and one more, and then we're done. And it looks like you're getting the book, unless... Uh, well, unless I do... Unless I, already, I already got the book. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, um, thank you. We've uh, just been delighted to have you. You've been great. You can come back anytime you want. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's, it's nice to have a home. <laughs> um, so my, my last thing, follow up here, you and your mom and I had a discussion over by the C6 this afternoon, back on globalization kind of, but your experience, and you were saying how the Europeans looked at us and how we looked at them. And uh, can you do that riff again? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Let me go back pocket for the material that I prepared. Um, we were discussing, we were actually discussing the future of all of these really insane, weird things that they're doing up there. And we're talking about, like, well, someday, you know, we have an, instead of going into a cave, you'll just have, like, an implant in the, the neuron that runs from your brain to your eye, and, and you won't even have to go into this thing. It'll just be, like, virtual reality right there. And part of me wants to say, like, whoa, because I think, I think, that there will soon be a backlash against all of this complete immersion in this world that doesn't exist. And by that world that doesn't exist, I mean kind of cyberland or whatever you want to call it. I've noticed after playing in Europe for so many years that because Europe has been around for a long, long time, like much longer than the US has been around, they kind of get the idea that you're probably not going to change much during your life, unfortunately. I'm sorry, but even if you do, it's not necessarily going to make you any happier. And they understand that what's really important is being able to stop work at 1.30, go home to their families, have a leisurely lunch, have a siesta afterwards, maybe go back to work, maybe not, maybe pay the American basketball player, maybe not, <laughs> but, but in, to enjoy that time that they have. And I think, I have this feeling that we're all going to turn off our laptops and, and get rid of the Blackberries and whatever, and realize that that stuff is really cool and it has great applications to medicine and, and science and who knows what else, could be pornography for all I know, but that it's not necessarily making our lives better or that it's making us happier. So as you go forward, and again, I'm not gonna try to predict because I've learned that you cannot predict. But I wouldn't say to put all of your hopes on technology. Remember that it's still going to be about being able to talk to someone, about being able to write a journal article or whatever, because people are always, I think, based on my experience in Europe, where people have been for a long, long time, they're always going to want to have this interaction between you and me. And as you are engineers, and as I was an engineer, we all need reminded of this, that. It's much more about whether you can get that information from your paper to the other person than it is about whether that information is correct. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you.